G'day everyone, Dicko here with another kick-ass walkthrough. I'm ultra excited about these next few videos because we're finally going to dive into modeling for character animation. Over the next few videos, I'm going to teach you how to model characters that can be used to do this, and this, and this. This is something that people have been begging for, and I want to do this justice, so I'm going to make this an ongoing series. I'm not sure how many videos it will take, but once we are done modeling, we're going to jump right into rigging and possibly animation. The lot. There are a lot of YouTube videos on character modeling, but I have yet to find any decent videos out there that go from modeling to actually rigging and animation. It's always such a pain in the ass to find a quality series that is not cock blocking you behind a paywall. So I want to rectify that. Now I'm considering this series to require an intermediate skill level when it comes to using Blender. So I expect you to understand the general tools for modeling and other UI elements within the software. If you are migrating from another software to model characters in Blender, then there's a shitload of introductory videos on the UI. So I suggest you go check those out first and then jump back into this series. That being said, the principles I'll be teaching you during this series are largely software agnostic. There may be a few tools in Blender to help streamline the process, but the end result will be the same regardless of whether you use Blender, Maya, ZBrush, or 3ds Max. Okay, with that out of the way, I'm going to start with my top 5 features of good animation models. In many ways, I regard this information as even more important than the process of modeling itself, so you better fucking pay attention. Just kidding. <laughs> but I'm serious, pay attention. So let's jump right into something that I prepared earlier. Alright, starting with number 5 and jumping straight into Blender, we're going to talk about modeling with intention. So what do I mean by modeling with intention? Well, it's basically a mindset more than anything else. It's the idea that you sort of mentally prepare for what you plan on doing with this rig or with this animation model. So for instance, if you're animating, you know, a short film, how much geometry do you really need to get what you need to achieve? Are you working with a high poly or low poly style to it? Are you working with a game engine? All those sort of things matter when it comes to planning on how you model your character for animation. The best example I have here is basically with the clothing. So for instance, in my case, my character will be switching her clothing or switching her costume as the story goes on. So she may start off with, uh, she's actually going to start off with these clothing, her basic tracky dacks and her tank top as she sits back and does her thing at home, which then changes into these nightclub attire. So what that means is I need to actually model her entire body. Whereas if I was just going to go with just these clothes for my entire animation, I technically really wouldn't need to an uh, model in these parts of the body. The stuff that isn't visible but because i have to be adaptable i need to have a decent base mesh to play with other considerations you need to ask yourself is performance so you can see here with the mesh if i just turn off my highlights the actual uh, amount of polygons i'm using for this model is fairly small there's not much going on in terms of complexity here and that's because I'm also working towards a sort of performance limitation. So I'm working on this film on my own with my single computer. So I need to be able to operate this rig and operate this character with as little performance hit as possible. Or at least have the opportunity to do so. And that's why it's always good to prepare mentally and also maybe write it down, write down some limitations for your own model your own film to determine how you're going to approach the design of your characters. All right, now let's continue on to number four, and that is modeling with scale. Modeling with scale is so fucking underrated. It's, it boggles my mind. Like when you download, um, you know, you download sample files from other, other website resources, you download, um, other people's rigs, the scales are all always out of place. It's real pain in the ass to, um, to work with. But when you model to scale, it makes life so much easier, at least modeling to scale within your own set parameters. So if you have a world scale of your own, always try to model to fit within that world. 
So for instance, Blender as a software works entirely in metric. Um, the grid system is basically based in meters. Um, in Maya, it's based in centimeters, which makes it a little bit painful to work with when you're moving files across, but that's okay. But in this case, because Blender works in meters, I can tell that whenever I make a cube, for instance, it's two meters squared. And you can see it here in the dimensions here. The great thing about knowing exactly what your dimensions are is that you can model your characters to a realistic world scale. So in this case, my character, I want it to be around uh, a meter, one meter, 1.7 meters tall. So the average sort of height for a, a woman, so to speak. So that means whenever I make something or find some other resources to fit within her own sort of world, it should be relatively easy to work with. So the other cool thing about that is that if you're working to a realistic scale, so in this case, you know, real world scale, stuff like hair particles, physics, all that sort of stuff tends to feel a little bit easier to manage because you're not dealing with weird numbers of scale, weird numbers to sort of compensate the scale with. So um, here's a great example. Um, I've downloaded a chair from BlendSwap and relatively speaking, the dimensions are pretty good. So this is someone else's modeled this. It's free to download, all that sort of thing. But if I just look at the dimensions of this thing, so let's have a look. It's telling me that the dimensions of this seat, at least, is about a meter wide, which is great for me because my character should be able to fit in this chair really quickly and really easily without me really screwing around with the parameters. So yeah, let's copy this chair. So I'm just gonna select all the bits that I need. One, two, three, four, five, not including the plane. Just select these guys. And I'm just going to copy it into my buffer and paste it straight into my scene. And you can see here, the chair is almost the perfect size for this character. And to demonstrate that, I made a little bit of animation. You may have seen it at the start of this video. And you can see here, she fits pretty damn comfortably in that seat without much changes to the scale. Or oh, any changes, really. Whoop. How much nicer is that life than having to go and fix other people's shit if they don't do things to scale properly? So yeah, totally underrated. You should do it. It's great. All right, getting into the nitty gritty with number three, we're gonna talk about edge flow or flow in general, basically. So it could be face flow, mesh flow, you name it. We're just gonna call it that. And that's referring to the actual flow of the faces as they are made or modeled into the character. So the way that you actually organize the flow of edges and the flow of faces throughout your body will give you either a good result or a bad result when it comes to animation, when it comes to rigging, when it comes to setting up this character to move, basically. So let's demonstrate by removing her clothes and let's have a look at a few things about this mesh and we'll see a few consistencies throughout the entire model. So let's jump into edit mode and you'll see as I select faces, around this edge, you'll see that there's some very clean and uh, precise placement of face loops. The way they flow around the mouth, for instance, or the way they flow around the eyes, it's all very much designed with the intention of animation. If you look at the shoulders, we have a nice loop that goes around the shoulders, giving us some extra geometry around that part of the body. If you look at the legs, especially the legs, I mean, you might see think that looks messy, but the actual loop here is actually representing the sort of bikini line of her legs, the crotch area, and it allows us to get the right amount of creasing as these legs move in a, in a walk cycle. We have very clean loops around the legs and there's no spiraling going on 
and it's present throughout the entire model basically. We have parts that emulate sort of chest cavity. We have parts that emulate the abs if you want to add that kind of detail. In this case I did. And when parts where I didn't really care, I just made it as a mesh, as a basic looped mesh. So where you need simplicity and where you need complexity is up to you. But generally speaking, you want to keep it fairly consistent across your mesh and get some really nice clean flow going throughout the body. For instance, we have a nice connection of the neck down to the arm and down to the hands. We have edge flow that follows the sort of curvature of the palm of our hand as it goes through. And if we were to put this into a walk cycle, which I have already created, so let's just chuck on our, our um, armature and demonstrate. So let's have a look and see how the mesh is being affected by the edge flow of this in this walk cycle. You can see the compression. You can see the edge flow is emulating the crotch as she walks. We're getting some nice compression as she takes that step. Because we have some decent distribution of meshes down here along the spine and around the chest. We're getting a smooth motion in the torso. Now let's have a look at the face. Oop, wrong animation. As we manipulate the face, You can see the, the uh, edge flow, the mesh flow, conforming to the distortion of that face in a really natural way. You can see how having these clean loops allows us to get really smooth and expressive uh, emotion out of the eyes and the mouth. You can see that there's squash and stretch happening, but because of the, loop, the way the loops are operating, we're getting a very smooth gradation of squash and stretch. And of course you can get the right amount of compression where you need to. So planning the edge flow of your character is super, super important. And let's have a look at one more element on this body which gives us a very good indication of what edge flow means. And that's in the hands. So let's just jump into the hands and have a look at how this operates when we start playing with, say, the fingers and thumbs. So notice how we have a bunch of edge loops. So let me just jump out of pose mode into object mode. Notice how we have an edge loop that sort of is mimicking the folds of the, fing of the palm. We have one going up and under. So if we have a look at that, you can see it sort of going around that sort of padded area of the hand. We have some similar sort of action going on around here as well. And you're always going to get some level of like uh, loop-de-loops going on in the hands because, you know, it all has to join together in some way. But in the end, we have one loop as well, just to separate that a little bit as well as we um, get into the details there. But let's have a look at how, uh, how this operates when we deform it. So let's move the thumb for instance. Notice how because of that edge flow, we're getting a really natural padding in that thumb. And if I were to, you know, rotate every element, we're getting a fairly nice deformation just out of the box with these with the um, the weights of the um, the rig in Blender, and I'll show you how that works once I go through the list and see and just show you how to us by planning and creating your mesh appro in appropriate ways, you can minimize the need to do extra technical work on top of your mesh.
after the fact, but see how it's deforming. See how it's automatically creating that crease where we need it to create that crease. That's super important and it all comes from proper planning and edge flow. And again, let's move this part of the palm. We're getting that automatic creasing going on where we want it. If we look at the fingers and I deform those fingers, we're getting creasing where we want that crease to happen. And that leads me right into number two, which is modeling for compression and elongation where appropriate. So that's an interesting little thing to talk about because we have to think about how your body or how your character is going to be moving or articulating in specific ways. And one of the best examples of that is in the elbows, the knuckles and knees of our characters. So let's have a look and inspect what's going on here. So when you look at your arm, think about the skin on your arm and the musculature of your arm. Would you say that there's more skin on the back of the arm than there is on the front? Would you say that when you're animating it, you would have to stretch out the back of your elbow more than what you would on the front? And you have to kind of think about that in those ways and I'll demonstrate by just articulating that arm a little bit so where there's going to be compression notice how there's less geometry than there is on the parts where there's going to be elongation and notice how just by thinking in that way we're getting some much some pretty good deformation out of the box with this character we're not getting mesh, a mesh that's sort of overlapping in on one another until we get really close together. So that allows us to get a pretty natural articulation in the arms and legs without much overhead and not without much compensation in terms of creating corrective shape keys and all that sort of jazz. Let's have a look at the legs and we'll do the same thing. Notice how the knees are maintaining their volume at the front because we've added that extra geometry in the body. We've reduced that geometry where the knee meets at the back. So we don't have to worry about having to weight paint that or create a creative shape key where necessary. We're getting a pretty good compression out of the box. And this is without any corrections going on. This is a straight up automatic white painted character by the way and I'll demonstrate why all these things matter at the end when it comes to creating a mesh that is easy to work with let's have a look at the fingers so I've created some extra geometry on the fingers especially around the knuckles to get what I want out of these character out of this character's hands So I get a nice sharp break where the knuckles sit. And that's really difficult to pull off when you are just working with spans. So if you're just working with like spans like this where you just have loops and loops and loops and loops and loops and loops without some sort of break to add up some extra geometry on the top. It's really a, a real pain in the ass to get some nice hard cornered um, knuckles and knees and stuff like that. You end up with like sort of spaghetti, uh, a spaghetti effect basically. So having that extra geometry on the top of the finger or on top of the, um, the digits allows for some better deformation where needed. You can see it happening right there as well. But as you can see, having compression and elongation and modeling with that in mind, you get a much nicer deformation out of the box. Okay, lucky last, number one. 
And this one's more of a pet peeve than anything else, but I find that if you follow this little rule, life is much, much, much more easier to deal with. And that is modeling with a center line. And what the hell do I mean by that? Well, I mean that if you're modeling and editing and then rigging and then having to go back to your sort of mesh and do some symmetrical edits and stuff like that, it's always really nice to have a nice clean center line that you can select and remove or break without any real effort. So for instance, here, notice how if I just isolate that selection, I can select the entire center of my character's body without any sort of interference or whatever. If I have to like sort of break the mirror of this character and then re-mirror it, I can. If I have to like just do some edits to this character from scratch with required, which does require me to edit the, um, the center line, I can. I don't have to worry about it. I can just push it, select that loop and delete it. And then I can sort of separate those faces. And then do my edits on one half and then go back and fix it all up without really having to go in and just change things in, in, a, in a really annoying way. And what do I mean by a bad example of that? So let me just demonstrate with a sort of average turbo squid model that I found online. And let's see what I can do. So apart from a few edge flow problems I find with this thing, like just this is just a really, I don't know, this, it's just too, too simple here. It's just the mess. Um, I have a few other issues with this model, namely this, this fucking star right here in the center of our body. Look what happens when I try to sort of select a center line of this model and I want to mirror it or sculpt it or whatever. Ugh, what a pain. What a pain in the butt. I can't really break it in a real easy way. I can't just delete the center line and then delete the rest. I'd have to maybe go into the edge flow, it, the center line here and then separate it like that and then delete it. But I'll always have that same issue whenever I bring it back. Like, just having that little star in the center is really annoying. So what I always like to do when I model, I always like to make sure that I have a set of faces that just go throughout the entire center line of my character. This is more of a personal preference than it is any sort of hard and fast rule. But it makes the edge flow just much more easier to deal with. It just makes the process less painful. Obviously I can't like I can't fix that that face straight up just you know because of the way it's mirroring at the moment. But you know it just makes the process just so much nicer to deal with. And especially when you were dealing with weight paints and having like a consistency between the center line. It's just much easier to deal with, and then I can, you know, sculpt in and delete, you know, fix things where needed. You know, I can sort of fix those up, I can bring in that mouth closer. And it's just nicer to work with, basically. And you won't get any pinching as well. And it just looks nicer when you smooth it out as well. So you don't have that weird pinch in the center there. Obviously her face is a bit fucked now because of that, uh, that mirroring, but you get the point. So yeah, I love to have that, just a nice clean center line to work with. I know that that's the center line because, you know, it travels throughout the entire body and it's nice and consistent. I just like having that personally. So with that in mind, let's jump back into my model. Now I'm going to do something crazy. I'm going to actually delete all of my weight paints just to show you how by having a nice, decent, quad-structured, edge-flowed, 
planned model how easy it is to start rigging and animating this character without really having to dive too much into you know the whole weight painting uh, corrective blend shapes all that sort of shit if you just plan it properly you could save yourself so much more time in the future so much uh you know you can save yourself from so much stress so many headaches and all that sort of shit so let's just demonstrate now I'm going to keep these ones locked because they are referring to certain parts of the body that I don't want certain bones to affect. But everything else, like the spine, the head, the neck, all that sort of stuff, I'm just going to delete all of those weight paints. Delete all those unlock groups. Bye bye. So, I've literally broken my rig. It's not working. Uh oh. Now let's just do a, a straight up automatic weights. Straight up. When I rig it. And just by having clean, consistent, easy to operate mesh, we're getting some really decent out of the box deformations. Like, I mean, the, look at this fucking face. I mean, this is amazing. Let me just turn off her mouth from opening so I actually have a lip seal look at that deformation amazingly clean her blinks let's see if the blinks work let's get up and close straight up so clean so consistent just by having that right kind of edge flow Look at the legs. I mean, look at that. Look at the crease around the crotch. Perfectly, you know, usable out of the box. You can easily start animating with this character if you wanted to. I mean, there's some consistent, there's some compression going on in the hips a little bit, but you know, if you had to make something in a dash, this is perfectly usable. The way that the legs are compressing, really nice. Again, let's have a look at that that mesh. Let's have a look at the overlay. Straight up, you know, and nothing has had to like, you know, you're looking at the way that these working, like the toes are working even. Like, look at that. A really smooth transition on the toes. We have the right articulation in the fingers. Again, let's go back to that thumb. And that's all because we planned the rig, the, the mesh appropriately for animation. We're getting that compression where we want it. We're getting that elongation where we want it. And then we can add extra stuff on top. So if you want to add that cartoony shit on top, we can. We can stretch it. We can mold it. We can make it super cartoony. We can make it all kinds of stuff. And that's just because we planned the rig appropriately. Now you may be wondering why I didn't get into the whole nitty gritty about maybe, oh, everything has to be quads, everything has to have, you know, you gotta reduce your triangles, you gotta, you know, not have poles everywhere. Well, that is really, really important, but it's something that we're gonna talk about so often during this process that I didn't wanna add it to this list. And it sort of comes with the whole edge flow uh, philosophy as well. Just keeping shit clean is super important and you'll see as we get into the details and as we work through this model together, we're going to talk about that so much. So I thought I'd give a list of things that are often overlooked when it comes to modeling for animation and I feel that these top five are definitely up there. All right, I may have said this was a top five, but I have actually one runner up tip and that is number six, to be proud of what you make. You may have been starting out this for the first time, you may have made a model a million times before, but it's always important to be happy with what you make, even if it doesn't turn out the way you want it. Every time you make a new model, every time you make a new character, every time you make a new rig, you should always be proud of what you make because you've learned something new, you've learned a new challenge, You've brought on some new skills. 
and furthermore it's just fun to work with this sort of stuff it's always fun to model it's always fun to make new characters and it's always fun and it's always something to be, to be proud of when you bring it to life so during this process don't forget to have fun don't take things too seriously when you're making this stuff experiment play with new things break the rules and enjoy enjoy the process have fun so until then until the next video which we're going to get into in a few days i will say catches thanks for watching